bought periodicity. To understand that, I think, would be to understand the ways that cognitive frameworks come together in wondrous wisdom, the divisions of everything. We're dealing with the most symmetric things in math, possibly the symmetry of math itself, where functional analysis, um, Lie theory, algebraic geometry, algebraic topology, analysis, uh, homological theory, everything is coming together, category theory, and that's daunting. I have a PhD in algebraic combinatorics. John Harland um, teaches uh, math and statistics at Palomar College. Uh, he has a PhD in functional analysis. I'm very glad that uh, he's agreed to join me as a fellow mountain climber to climb this huge mountain. Uh, and so we're like a band of superheroes uh, forming together. And each of us has our own strengths, our own tools, our own experiences. So today, um, John will have a chance to start warming up, checking our tools, uh, the basic things relating to um, uh, orthogonal group, special orthogonal group, unitary group, but um, looking at them potentially in a very deep way, uh, including with uh, spectral theorem. So I'm very happy uh, that my old friend, uh, John, is on this journey with me. Perhaps you'll join us. Uh, I am Andrus Kulikauskas. This is Math for Wisdom. When I was visiting you a couple of weeks ago, we spent a considerable amount of time um, talking about and getting motivated to study bot periodicity. Um, and so, you know, my, my particular preference when I study something like this is to really understand the objects involved. Um, date this 613. It's interesting you say that because you've also told me that the way to understand the objects is to understand uh, uh, the functions on them or like the representations. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's, yeah, and representation theory for sure. I mean, that's, so yeah, I mean, all that, all that might come into play, like, well, might be able to circle back to physics, um, you know, keeping that stuff in mind. But so bot periodicity involves, you know, uh, various uh, sets of matrices, or we can call the, think of these as linear transformations. Uh, well, like, for example, the orthogonal group, these are n by n matrices over the real numbers. And they satisfy uh, T um, T transpose. Oh, I shouldn't use T because I'm going to use it for transpose. <laughs> by, yeah. <laughs> so so A is in the this set of orthogonal matrices, if and only if its transpose is its inverse. And, and I want to jump in right in here, uh, maybe okay. come come back, come boozle you. But see, for me as a combinatorialist, uh, that is very uh, fascinating um, because uh, if you have two matrices, let's say if you have a matrix, you can calculate the inverse uh, using, I think it's a Kramer's uh, formula, right? Yeah. You'll get like a determinant over determinants, you know, et cetera which is very complicated. You can show combinatorially that it works. But what this is saying is that that inverse, which normally would be so complicated to calculate, is actually just inverting the entries. You see, so like a matrix, uh, a generic matrix A with uh, entries A, uh, I, J is encoding an arrow from I to J. And so the inverse is just turn the arrow around. 
you see. So that's fascinating. Like that's the simplest thing you could do for the entry. And if you think of it, that's inverting it. So it turns out that is actually inverting the entire matrix if you do that uh, in a general way. And when you look at the unitary matrix, there's a similar issue. And if you look at the complex symplectic, it's a similar issue. So I think that that'll show someday we'll see like why that's uh, important. That's uh, I end my interruption. But yeah, no, I, I I get it. You know, I mean, it's it's really kind of fascinating thinking about that angle. And who better think about that than you? You're all tooled up for that. So this is, uh, you know, A is in the unitaries. If you know the the conjugate transpose is the inverse. Mm -hmm. You know, if A is equal to aij then a star it's 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 adjoint so to speak is a j i but now you have to take complex conjugates so you know these are and, two and now mm -hmm. um i'll step on your toes more uh okay. see so the conjugate is also very important for wondrous wisdom actually because um what um what this is all about i think is about the three minds you know what they're operating on but the three minds there's the unconscious there's the conscious and then there's the consciousness that kind of balances them so um when you have a conjugate it really is like a reflection and in uh, there's a very important theme here throughout bot periodicity where like you'll have linear and anti-linear or like you'll have rotations and you'll have a uh, uh, roto reflections but you can have a reflection or not. And basically, reflection takes you in a different universe. So the idea is that this mathematical reflection basically is modeling mental reflection. And when you take a conjugate, it's saying that, oh, you have to reflect. So it's saying that somehow the reflecting is part of taking the inverse. Hmm. What does that mean? I don't know. But I think that I'm starting to try to tune into these things. You know, so the first step, these are two of the objects involved in Bob period. You see, there's also the um, SP special. I'm sorry, what what did you what 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 are the words that go with SP? It's SP of N, and I think uh, the one that we call it would be complex symplectic. Sometimes they're just okay. called symplectic, but there's two different groups that are called symplectic. So just for clarity's sake, I think it's called complex sim compact symplectic. Okay, so we'll we'll get to that later. Um, yeah, but the first step. Of bot periodicity, which is is relating O of two n, and then taking a subset of O of two n and associate with u n, mm -hmm. and so. Um, So, you know, it's very, you know, it's very to understand even that first step, we have to understand sort of the decomposition of these, these kinds of matrices. So what I want to focus on, you know, I mean, later we'll, we'll do the grand sweep where we'll, you know, analyze the general cases for both these mm -hmm. in detail. But uh, today I just want to look at something that we were, um, you know, um, trying trying to unpack when I was mm -hmm. in Lithuania. And that, let's look at the special case of O2 and O3. And I think that by... And then we can um, talk a little bit about O4, although it it's, it's surprising how... Um, how it, you know, when you go to O4, and above, things get uh, a little more complicated. You know, there's mm -hmm. cases that cases that you know require an unpacking that is kind of unique to four and above. So maybe we'll, maybe we'll get there today. Maybe not. But let's talk about O two. O two. This is two by two uh, orthogonal matrices. Two by two orthogonal matrices, and um, 
so meaning that you know we have a matrix a equal you can write this as alpha beta gamma delta where we're saying that a transpose times a is equal to the identity Now, and so we're going to figure out what all possibilities of these kinds of matrices are. Um, we could do it by brute force. We could just use this, and, and that imposes some restrictions on this, and we could just start doing the algebra. But we can be a little bit more finessed about it. Um, you know, this right here is saying that A has orthonormal columns, if you think about that. Because the way matrix multiplication works, A transpose uh, takes the columns of A and makes them the rows of A transpose. So we're taking rows of A, which is given by A transpose, times columns of A gives you the identity, which means that the columns of A, when you take their dot products, you either get one or zero. And if you take the dot product of column one with itself, which is given by the one one entry of A transpose times A, you get one. If you take the dot product of say column one of A times column two of A, this times this, the dot product of that, which is gonna be the one two entry of this, you're gonna get zero. So if you, if you um, think about that, for a moment, you realize that that means that the columns must be orthonormal. So, so usually a matrix multiplication would be a row times a column, but if you're transposing the rows, they become columns. So now it's a column times a column, and they're coming from the same matrix, yeah. and they have to give you the identity. So if you're doing column times a column, uh, the, and they're all they're all orthonormal. Well, then if they're different columns, you should get zero. But if they're the same column, you should get one because they're orthonormal. Right. So, so again, I'm, I'm assuming the listeners know what matrix multiplication is and all that stuff. Yeah. Um, you know, we could we could do that in more detail. but And that, and that orthogonal matrices really means that they're orthonormal. Yeah. So that right? Or, that's yeah. right. A is in the orthogonal matrices, the two by two are not orthogonal matrices, if and only if the columns of A are or the normal. Yeah. Okay. So another fact. So this is, you know, kind of like a uh let's call this theorem one. And uh the other uh thing to note is that the determinant of A transpose is equal to the determinant of A. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that means that the determinant of A transpose, so determinant of the identity, if we take the determinant on both sides of this equation, it means one, which is the determinant of the identity, starting from the right and moving left. That's the determinant of A, A transpose, A transpose A, which is the determinant of a transpose determinant of A, because determinant is a multiplicative function. And this says this is a determinant of A squared. So we get theorem two. The determinant of A is equal to plus or minus one if A is an O2. So there's two cases we can consider, plus one and minus one. Mm -hmm. All right. So let's just, let's call this case one determinant A is equal to one. So what are the possibilities when determinant of A is equal to one? So you can work it out, and 
again, I'd rather not work out the details here. I'd rather just kind of get the grand sweep. So um, we'll look at details in a, in a, you know, when I write out, when I write out more detailed notes. But uh, we did this computation when we were sitting at your table mm -hmm. in Lithuania. And what did we get? There's, there's only one possibility here. So the only possibility is that A is equal to, it's got to be of the form cosine theta, sine theta, negative sine theta, um, cosine theta. For theta, somewhere in the interval, uh, say, negative pi to pi. So it's either uh, a clockwise or counterclockwise rotation, whether you know, depending on whether you've got a positive or negative angle. And I'm gonna I'm gonna call this R sub theta. It's a two by two rotation matrix. Mm -hmm. And is that the only possibility? I believe so for the two mm -hmm. by two. That's the only one. That's the only one. Okay. So you just have to work it out. Um, you can work it out just purely algebraically, or you can do it, you can use. Um, and, and you can see, and I, I may do a video like to do all this in gory detail, but um, you can see from here that cosine squared theta uh, minus minus sine squared theta is the same. You know, it's cosine squared theta plus sine squared theta. Well, that'll equal one. So you get your determinant equal to one. Right, right. So I'm sorry, I'm looking through this. Um, but there's another way of analyzing this. So this just means that geometrically, And I think it's really um, key to interpret this geometrically to understand. It means okay. it means that we're just you know we're in the plane. This is R two, and what is this? What is this? Um, due to vectors in R2, we have a vector, you know, say U in R2, and it just simply rotates it either, either clockwise or counterclockwise, depending on whether you have a positive or negative theta, you know, by a certain angle, and it keeps the same length. Mm -hmm. So we preserve the origin on these rotations. So that's the only possibility for an orthogonal matrix um, with determinant equal to one. Now determinant equal to minus one. Um, actually, I'd like to do a little bit more um, because you know you and I thought about the spectral theory for this if you do the spectral decomposition, the eigenvalues and eigenvectors, let's take a look at what that means, because that's going to be instructive for relating to um, O, you know, O n to U n. Okay, the eigenvalues. If you want to get a little bit deeper and try to understand these kinds of matrices in terms of eigenvalues and eigenvectors. In other words, a spectral decomposition. Mm 
Well, the eigenvalues are e to the i theta and e to the minus i theta, if you work that out. And so, by the spectral theorem, we should be able to write r theta equal to um, a unitary matrix e to the i theta, e to the minus i theta, zero, zero. And maybe I can ask, like, I can understand e to the i theta would be a rotation by theta. And so why would e to the minus i theta, that's a rotation in the opposite direction, but why would that be? Yeah. Would that well, work? So it, it turns out, uh, I mean, do you, you believe that those are the eigenvalues, right? Um, or do I? Well, I'm not going to go against math, but um, okay. but intuitively, I'm just wondering, like, e to the i theta, I believe. You know, but so I don't understand intuitively why does e to the minus i theta? What's that? What's being said there? Okay, so let's say that's the eigenvalue. So oh, is, maybe if the vector, it depends on the vector, right? So right, it does, it does, and we're going to we're going to we're going to decompose that. We're we're going to we're going to actually look at the vectors, but this is viewed as a matrix over. Is a two by two matrix over C. In other words, we're now thinking of our matrix, even though it started out as a real matrix, <clears throat> this also operates on C2. Mm -hmm. Which so, includes R2. Which includes which R2. R2. So if you're willing to, you know, if you're if you're not willing to look at complex numbers then uh, you know you're stuck in r2 and forever this is going to be your way of thinking about this matrix but you know you might say what if we go to c2 and and see what this matrix says about its action on c2 then we can have yeah a that's the that's maybe to answer my point uh, is that if we just stick to r2 right if we just stick to the real like geometrically we know that any vector is going to be rotated. So that vector cannot be brought to a, uh, a um, you know, to a copy of itself unless that rotation would be zero, let's say, or unless that rotation was, let's say, um, pi. But for a general rotation, you know, if it's not zero or pi, um, it's never going to be, um, there's no vector that's going to, you know, it's rotating all the vectors by the same angle. So if that means that simply there is no eigenvector does not exist. So the, the eigenvalue won't exist because there's no eigenvector in the real yeah, case. There's no, there's no there's no invariant direction. And an mm -hmm. eigenvector requires an invariant direction. So you're not going to get it over R. Um, so um, it's only over C that you always are guaranteed an eigenvalue. An eigenvector mm -hmm. C is a complete field, right? When you, when you mm -hmm. look characteristic equation to find the eigenvalues you're always going to be able to find at least one complex eigenvalue mm -hmm. and so there's always going to be you know for any either real or complex matrix there's always going to be an eigenvalue and eigenvector but not not if you're right. just so you know i think we got a little bit hung up on this when we were talking about this in lithuania so i just wanted to kind of unpack this a little bit mm -hmm. thank um, you so it turns out that if you look at the eigenvalues, um, it's e to the i theta and e to the minus i theta. The mm -hmm. eigenvectors are these vectors right here. Now, I normalize by one over square root of two pi so that this would be a unitary matrix. Mm -hmm. um, so the structural theorem says that you can always decompose, um, uh, you know, say symmetric matrix or a, in this case uh any any you know, you know complex um in this case this complex matrix allows for spectral decomposition um and 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 for somebody like me just to make it um, relatable to the eigenvalues and eigenvectors uh that's just another form of the of the other you know like if you if you multiplied on the right by u you would get r theta, the rotation uh, theta times u equals u times this diagonal. Well, 
that diagonal you could put on the left because it's just uh those are just uh it's a diagonal matrix right so those commute oh no it does not necessarily commute with you this oh it doesn't commute with you no not i necessarily. see because if it was purely if it was uh oh because uh the these you were say equal because the numbers these were are equal. different yeah. right um yeah so now but why but, are but 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 if these are the eigenvalues they should be able to be written in that form r theta times u equals eigenvalues times u no uh well i mean you could you can bring you can bring um You can bring this u over, and that becomes this u star. That becomes a u here, and you can bring this over, and that becomes a u star there. No, no, not about that. No, I'm just trying to get the normal, the usual form. Where like, I guess, well, maybe you have to look at it column by column. Like to say, r theta times a eigenvector equals eigenvalue times an eigenvector, right? Yeah, right. So that would hold. Uh, I could commute column by column. I think I can do that, right? I have to be able to do that because I have to be able to get the formula r theta times eigenvector equals well, yeah, eigenvalue if you times columns, eigenvalue. Yeah, yeah. If you switch the columns of u, you can switch these things. Yeah. So. Okay. Okay. That's okay. then. I'm just confusing other people, but I'm not confusing myself. I understand. Okay. Thank you, John. So these are eigenvectors. I mean, if you want, we can. No, this is good. We keep, keep going. Fair, yeah, fair this fine. is very good. This is and you also, spelled it out. You know, something something that I should have noted here is that note. Actually, we should write this as theorem three. The eigenvalues of any orthogonal matrix are either one, negative one, or they occur in pairs, conjugate pairs, e to the i theta, e to the minus i theta. Mm -hmm. Now, why is that? So this is just a general, general um, fact about O n. And what is the reason for that? Well, first of all, um, you know the determinant a minus lambda i is a real polynomial in lambda. Real meaning that all of its coefficients are real. So determinant a minus lambda i is equal to zero if and only if you take the complex conjugates of everything in sight but the complex conjugate now i'm writing a complex conjugate just meaning take the complex conjugate of everything in a um, complex conjugation is a algebra hom homomorphism. So, you know, if you take the complex conjugate of this, you're going to end up with this right here. So take the complex conjugate of everything in sight, but the complex conjugate of a real matrix is just itself. Now, I don't mean the transpose, I just mean the complex conjugate. So... Lambda is an eigenvalue of a real matrix. A if and only if 
lambda star is an eigenvalue. I mean, lambda bar is an eigenvalue, it's complex conjugate. Mm -hmm. So for real matrices, which orthogonal matrices are, We get if we get a complex eigenvalue, we also get as complex conjugate. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then the other fact if A is an orthogonal matrix, all of its eigenvalues are unimodular. Mm -hmm. In other words, their modulus is one. And how do you see that? That should be pretty easy. Let's see. Um, um, you um, Uh, so it, we're going to have to use the fact that A transpose times A is equal to the identity. Um, well, we also know that the, the determinant is the product of the eigenvalues, right? Yeah, but um, but you can get a product of one or negative one by means of lots of different, okay, you know, lots of different ways. So. Uh, Maybe you know in the more detailed notes, I think I'll I'll write this up. But right now, I I'm not. It's escaping. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Uh, if you take like for example the determinant of a minus lambda i, um, decompose i that way. Yeah, I'm. I don't know. I'm. I'm. I'm blocking on. We'll work it out. I mean, it's. It's. That's it's, fine. It's easy to. It's easy to prove. I'm just sort of like not seeing it. Not seeing. I can. It. I can work on that. Yeah. Yeah, work on that. That's. That's pretty easy to reproduce. Um. Anyway, so that means. Um. So this is a manifestation of the general rule that if we get a eigenvalue of e to the i theta, we also have an eigenvalue of e to the minus i theta. And why? Why are we? Why are we guaranteed a spectral decomposition? Because, you know, if A transpose A is equal to the identity, then you can also reverse the order that A, A transpose is equal to the identity. And uh, that means that A transpose A is equal to A, A transpose, which means that A commutes with its adjoint, and that's a normal operator. All normal operators are diagonalizable. So we're going to get to that in the more detailed treatment. Uh, later and and what where did the adjoint come in here? The adjoint is uh, the transpose is the adjoint of a real is the adjoint in the yeah. real case. Okay, in the real case. yeah. So um, yes, the conjugate yeah the adjoint is the conjugate transpose. But if all the entries are real, then mm. the conjugate transpose is the transpose. So so. Um, so we are, you know, the spectral theorem is it does apply here, and we we end up with the spectral decomposition. Kind of weird because our eigenvectors and eigenvalues can be complex unless theta is equal to zero or pi or two pi or whatever. Mm -hmm. Multiple of mu multiple of pi, uh, you'll get real. You'll get real. Also, what's it's very interesting that the eigenvector here does not depend on theta. Is that right? Um. Which is interesting. Yes, it does not. Um, because also, like, in the case, like, e to the i theta and e to the minus i theta, like, uh, theta could go to zero, right? Yeah. And if theta goes to zero, it's interesting. Well, then every, <laughs> well, if theta goes to zero or theta goes to pi, um, you're looking at, um, 
you're looking at like the matrix I or negative I and every single vector is an, is an eigenvector of those two matrices, right? right. Uh, negative I, every vector is an eigenvector. So uh, these eigenvectors are still eigenvectors of R theta. Oh, they're yeah. still, I see. They're still eigenvectors of R theta. It's just that, it's just that they're kind of, you know, you would never you would never analyze it that way if you had the identity or negative identity. Um, okay, well, good because, point. Yeah, I mean you could you could formulate those eigenvectors. Well, and so that's what that what that's saying though. Um, to kind of um, click it into my mind, this is saying that if theta goes to zero, e to the i theta and e to the minus i theta are no longer distinct. So they're two copies of the same eigenvalue. And so you're not getting um, eigenvectors that are, you know, in the linearly distinct, I guess. Uh, it's just this open two two dimensional space where, like you say, it could be anything. You can break it down any way you like. Um, so uh, if you want e to the i theta and e to the minus i theta to be distinct eigenvalues, then they can't have theta equal to zero. Right. That's right. Okay. Let's take a look at, I mean, it's kind of, again, this is just sort of a curiosity getting the spectral decomposition, but I think yeah. it's going to help us. I think it's going to help us when we talk about Bob periodicity. Mm -hmm. I have a, I have a sneaking suspicion that, that, you know, this whole thing's going to be. And so this is the spectral decomposition you're saying of R of yeah. theta, right? That's right. Okay. It it's is, the eigenvectors and, and then uh, the eigenvalues on the diagonal and then the. Right then the adjoint uh mm -hmm. yeah and so these are the eigenvalues of the eigenvectors of r theta we're making progress it's exciting we I'm making are progress. we you're, are you're it's just you know i mean it's <laughs> i get it it's a snail space <laughs> but that's okay um so um and again I, I i intend to make much more detailed notes about this that we can squeak through faster because i'll prepare them ahead of time um but yeah i mean there's you know i mean when you take down all the moving parts there's a lot of them um so you know what does this mean okay so So what it means is that if you take R theta on one of these vectors here, say I, I negative I, you get E to the I theta, I negative I. I certainly hope that's true. I think I... Mm -hmm. I mean, do you want to let, let's just let's go through this comp. I'm I'm like thinking. Yeah, I like, think it's a good composition to to do. Check, I would be happy. Uh, check. Let's just do it fast. Oh, and then we have to rotate it with a two by two matrix. That's yeah. right. And then use the fact Euler's formula that e to the i theta equals uh, yeah. cosine theta plus i sine theta. Yeah. Yeah. We're just doing warm up exercises here. That's good for stretching our okay. legs for the big hike. So you get, you get, getting the rocks out of our shoes. Yeah. So you get, way. you get cosine theta plus i sine theta. Mm -hmm. And you get sine theta minus sine theta minus i cosine theta. Mm -hmm. And so what we're going to do is we're going to uh, write this as... That's all right. We can just... I think we can read that. That's all. It's clear. Yeah. So, so this is going to be... You did it. Yeah. Okay. E to the i theta. Well, I'm not sure. So sure I did it. Um, and this is going to be negative i times e to the i theta. By Euler's formula, right? Negative i. We got a negative i. Yes, absolutely. So this gives us e to the i theta, one negative i. Okay, boom. Yeah. Okay. And then you can check the other one. 
I think we did this one. That's good. Yeah. Well, let's just write it down. Okay, that's fine. Negative, what's the other one? It is negative I1 <clears throat> is equal to E to the minus I theta, negative I1. Okay. So, and we also know that R theta on this two-dimensional subspace of just like alpha beta with alpha beta real mm -hmm. is equal to rotation mm -hmm. um, of alpha beta through angle beta. Okay, so This tells us that, so let's, um, this is actually a summary. Let's just do a summary. So on this two-dimensional real subspace of C2, Since we're viewing everything as embedded in C2 right now, so in, on R2, viewed as a two-dimensional real subspace of C2, R theta rotates vectors. R theta. Two. On the one-dimensional, complex subspace let's call it um let's give it a name or am i not Let's call it um, complex subspace. Let's call it K1, which is just the span of this first eigenvector. One, negative one. Negative I, rather. That's a one-dimensional complex eigen subspace, which can be viewed as a two-dimensional real subspace. Got one complex dimension is two real dimensions. Mm -hmm. R theta multiplies vectors by E the I theta. It's expanding rotation yeah. in the complex plane. By theta. So it does the same thing you know, geometrically to those vectors. And well, except that in a complex plane, uh, rotation can be understood as a expansion by a scalar, right? As a scaling. Well, by which a it, complex, which it, by unimodular complex well, scalar. Well, by a right, by a complex scalar. So okay. So and then you know, for span of the other one, K2 which is negative I1, we're taking the mm -hmm. span of that, R3 three multiplies vectors 
by e to the minus i theta. Mm -hmm. This is rotation. In that complex, that one-dimensional complex plane um, by negative theta. So to see the total action here, if you look at C2, I mean, you can make a little diagram here. Okay, so you get K1 and K2. These are orthogonal subspaces of C2. And then somewhere in between the two of them, you get R2. Mm-hmm. So R2, we get rotation. Here, we get multiplication by... Right, e, I think that's a better term, right. Which is, if you look at that little... And this is isomorphic to C, which is isomorphic in a certain sense to R, if you want to look at that, R2... And this is isomorphic also to C. It's a one-dimensional. It's a one-dimensional subspace, which is really isomorphic to R two geometrically. So, if you want to look at how all this stuff is working, we get multiplication by e to the i theta. Here we get multiplication by e to the minus i theta, which is rotation by negative negative but, theta. So these are it, all subspaces of C2. And and it's very nice that you write all that up because it kind of shows what the e to the i theta, e to the minus i theta is about. It's really about the isomorphism between C and R2, I suspect. Because uh, see, with that isomorphism, uh, you can set up that isomorphism in two different ways, right? Like, you know, one where um, you're going clockwise and one where you're going counterclockwise, right? Yeah. So so it's not like it's not like one of them was the real rotation and the other one is the opposite. It's no, it's like there's these two isomorphisms and you're choosing them. Also, um it it brings back home to this idea of the twinning, you know, so e to the i theta and e to the minus i theta are are conjugates. And it's not like one is positive or the the other is negative. They're they're uh, indistinguishable in that sense. You're just naming one of them positive, but you don't even know which one you're naming positive. So, just ranting here, but yeah, I mean, we were I think we were struggling with this, and it would it, maybe that maybe maybe there's a deeper way of understanding it in terms of what you just said in other words there's different ways of embedding c r2 into c2 right, right. and these are th three different embeddings of really something isomorphic or geometrically isomorphic to r2 into into c where you can make sense of a very simple action of this matrix um r theta on on these subspaces but, and, and so we 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 can become victims of abusive notation, you know, like uh, this this lopsidedness of the i theta and minus i theta is really more about notation, not about the reality. The reality is that I think, uh, I think you might be right. I think you might, you know, I'm 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 sensing that you're right. That see, really, these are isomorphic. These are real isomorphic. Going mm -hmm. from here to here are real isomorphic. And see, it's just you had to break, notation forced you to break the uh, symmetry. So you broke the symmetry, say, well, this one will be I theta, that one will be, have to be negative I theta, right? But and if I you didn't break the symmetry, then you wouldn't have this weirdness where why is one of them the quote unquote right rotation and the other one is the wrong rotation, you know, or the. I, I but suspect both... what's happening here is that K1 and K2 are related just by conjugation. All right. Is is that true? If we conjugate, if we conjugate this vector here, we get one i. Oh, let's see. No, let's go back up here. If we conjugate the first column here, we get one i. And so one i, if you multiply by negative i, 
you get negative i one. So, so yeah, I mean these are related by conjugation, up to a up to a scaling, up to a unimodular scaling, like going from here to here. You can think of it as a conjugation. So anyway, that's that's maybe a, okay. a, a kind of a fun way. Of it's helpful. It. It's helpful because it's a uh, peeling away, you know, problematic thinking. Yeah. So I think that there is some real isomorphism going on from here to here. It's a real isomorphism, not a complex isomorphism. Mm -hmm. And so you're right. We're just looking at things uh, kind of upside down in K2 as opposed to K1. So it looks like a negative. Maybe. Well, upside down, given the convention, right? Like, you know. All these conventions were put on after the fact, uh, just in terms of labeling, right? Like, you know, you chose a convention for R2. You chose a convention for C, right? Right. And the notation has that prejudice of that choice, I think. Okay. <laughs> this is my little, I'm woke. <laughs> That's all I, yeah. I'm oh. woke on the complex twinness but i mean the fact that you have both eigenvalues e to the i theta and e to the minus i theta represented here is not artificial you know i mean well no but it's just it, i theta and i it's i theta bar right like right it is it is yeah so um yeah anyway you know maybe maybe that's going to help us later on uh this kind of this kind of uh thinking in terms of real isomorphisms is going to help us later on the, the complex conjugation is not a complex isomorphism, but it's a real isomorphism. So um, so maybe that'll help and, us. You know, we'll and, keep that. And do, but, but, do we have time to, do we end here or do we have time to look at the rotor reflections? I think that maybe next time we should look at rotor reflections. Again, you know, things are moving okay. slower than I thought, but, but this is productive, right? You know? Yeah, so, no, this is very good. And you, you know, yeah. you have a, a very deep, deep look at it. Um, so, so, and then, and I think what we do is we, we look at the rotor, well, actually there's not going to be rotor reflections in C2. It's just going to be outright reflections across a particular. Yeah, that, that's, see, that's also interesting that that'll just be restricted to R, which is very interesting because C2 yeah. seems so big, right? Like, and then that's just restricted to R, but it's like basically half the action. I mean, half the, half the excitement. Yeah. It, it well, I mean, rotation is inherently complex you know because it's multiplication by e i theta um but well but, but if you complex. add a reflection it's all the same information it's just reflected reflection and here again complex. the wondrous wisdom to say like imagine the unconscious as all this rotation stuff direct experience but when you reflect it that may explain the advantage of reflection is that it reduces it all to reality like to to I mean to the to the plane let's say right like it, it's the same information, but it all gets kind of presented. Uh, reflection somehow is able to um, make it in in that. Let me give you a preview, just to just to mm -hmm. tantalize your appetite a little bit, um, to whet your appetite. So, um, I had this written down in summary form. Where are you, summary? There you are. For determinant of a equal negative one, as I guess I called case two, um, there's a re really the eigenvectors, the spectral decomposition looks like this a is equal to one, negative one, zero, zero. So in this case, We just get two eigenvalues, one and negative one. Those are the only possibilities. Mm -hmm. But what's sitting on either side here? Negative sine theta, cosine theta? Uh, well, it's theta over two. Um, it's kind of funny. The 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 axis of, of reflection is given by oh, theta. Oh, 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 the eigenvectors, I see. Yeah, so the eigenvectors are... Yeah, so the eigenvectors in this case, um, I think we can write it in terms of, let me just see if I can decipher this. Um, I'm thinking of A, what A looks like, but. Uh, ah, I, I think, 
so it, it's kind of funny. It, it's a little, uh, little. Well, first of all, A is got A is going to be different. It's going to look like this. It's going to be have a negative determinant, so it's going to be cosine theta, sine theta, sine theta, negative cosine theta. Okay. I'm going to call this T theta instead of R theta. That's what it's going to look like. But it turns out this theta. Uh, wait, 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 wait. I think is that right? Shouldn't it be? Shouldn't it be a uh, sine theta negative cosine theta? Oh, it is. I'm sorry. You can write. I, I switched the rows. Okay, and so then, the, you, I I write the row, the bottom row, and the top row. So it's the I, same thing. And I'm sorry. This. Uh, so if I write this out, let me just write out what I have in my notes. Yeah. It, mm -hmm. It's a little. It's a little weird. If you do the spectral decomposition here, um, you end up with. these operators, sine theta over two, mm -hmm. negative cosine theta over two, cosine theta over two, sine theta over two. Mm -hmm. And then you have the transpose over here. And so, um, so what this really is, it's a reflection in, so it's a rotation, this is a rotation, and then a reflection across the X axis, and then another rotation. And then what this really means is it's a reflection in R2 across what axis? Uh, X equals Y or or no? Oh uh, well no, this is this is um first rotating and then reflect oh, I'm sorry. And, and then a, and then an opposite rotation. So, right. Okay. So it's it's so one axis. It's Mm -hmm. So it's a, so it's not a reflection across the x-axis, a reflection across um, the y-axis. Well, no, across an axis. At an angle theta over two. If you unpack this, and we'll we'll do this in more detail next time, but I just wanted mm -hmm. to kind of do a preview. Okay, you're just getting a preview preview so we're doing a reflection across this n-axis and this n-axis is at theta over two from the x-axis i see that's what the and so we are taking vectors you know so you're taking a vector say in you know vector like this and reflecting it across to a vector like this across this fixed axis to a new vector over here. So V goes to a reflected vector. Across that's not any V, that's the eigenvector. Is that right, or? Well, the eigenvector is actually n. That's that's kept. Oh, n is the eigenvector. I see. This is eigenvector with eigenvalue. But v also gets rotated. It's a or not? It's a roto reflection. 
Well, v is v is transformed into the opposite of v, but it turns out that any vector, you know, I wrote this. You know, you could also have a vector out here. V and that gets reflected across the axis to another vector, say like this. So we're really talking about reflection across this fixed axis. And you're saying that's a rotor reflection, basically, right? It's well, it's actually a reflection. It, it's it's a reflection across a pure axis n. And they they all look like this. You're saying, right? Or... Yeah, they all look like that. And and but, where, where's mm -hmm. the how? What is it? What is the geometric significance of theta? Well, it turns out that. It's not theta that's geometrically significant in the case of reflections. It's theta over two. Well, but there's another way to look at this, I think, where you what you do is uh, you reflect by theta. I mean, sorry, you rotate by theta, but reflect across the y-axis, for example. You will. That's equivalent. Which that's means, equivalent. Yeah, but I think what this is saying is you rotate by, is this rotation by negative theta or by higher over two months. I think it would be, I mean, I don't, in the way that I calculated, like you rotate by the angle, but then you reflect. And so when you combine that, you get eigenvectors that are real because the reflection can happen to equal the rotation. So you know, I'm they getting, can balance you out. You rotate by, you rotate by theta over two. And then no, in your, in the way you do it, because, but I'm saying in the, there's another way to think about, it, I think where you, I'll I'll have to look up what I did. Yeah. But, uh, anyway, we'll we'll get to this next time. But that's yeah. that's that's uh, and it, it's interesting that the structural decomposition, the rotation matrices in this case, are variable. Um, but the but the but the diagonal matrix in the middle is is constant. Where in the case of rotation. Mm -hmm. Oh, the eigenvectors were constant. The eigenvectors right. constant, but the the diagonal matrix in the middle is variable. So, and, and that's a very deep thing to think about. It'll be interesting how that relates. Uh, you know, we'll look at the general case and how it relates to the unitary case. Uh, but again, like this theme of like, how does the unconscious work with direct experience, and how does the conscious work with reflected experience, and why why would you do one and the other? Like, what's the qualitative difference? This is speaking very much, I think, to that, hopefully, yeah. uh, if this works out. I may have been wrong about the things I said. I may have been right. Uh, I just want to add a concluding uh, prayer to thank you for walking this walk with me, to invite others who'd like to walk with us, and just to marvel at, like, well, the hope that maybe this all can have very deep meaning. So thank you to God. Thank you to you. Yeah. So, yeah, it's a, it, you know, so we're gonna we're gonna finish the two by two um, um, reflection in detail next time, mm -hmm. and let's go on to O three because that okay. things get kind of interesting with O three. There's different cases, and then mm -hmm. we'll go on to O four and realize that there's kind of a lot going on there, and then and then, uh, but that'll be that'll be that's where we kind of need this machinery of spectral theory to to break things down in a way that we end up getting oh, good. Two by two we had, with O4, we can get these two by two blocks of R theta and T theta mm -hmm. uh, down the main diagonal, but that's as complicated as it can get. Okay, very good. Right. Thank you, Jim. Thank you for watching this video. Please uh, go to mathforwisdom.com or simply read the description to this video to learn how you can join our Math for Wisdom discussion group and our study groups. Thank you for liking this video, for subscribing to this YouTube channel, and for supporting Math for Wisdom through Patreon. I became a Math for Wisdom Patreon supporter. I went to the webpage, patreon.com, found Math for Wisdom, and after just a few minutes of filling a few things out, boom, I was a Math or Wisdom Patreon supporter. You can do it too.